Mass migration has become a political and social nightmare in Western Europe. But there is one country that has seemingly managed it better than anyone else. In this video, we'll explain how and why Denmark is solving the mass migration crisis. Denmark has seen its migrant population grow over the years, but in the 90s, attitudes started to change towards mass migration. Known for its tolerance and defense of human rights, Denmark became skeptical of asylum seekers, viewing multiculturalism as something negative. This is a country that ratified the UN Refugee Convention in 1951, its core principle being non refoulement which asserts that refugees should not be returned to a country where they face serious threats to their life or freedom. However, a strict immigration and asylum policy became common ground amongst the two big political parties since the Danes supported such policies. In the aftermath of the rise in popularity of the Danish People's Party, the success of Nordic countries, as with any other model society, results from their societies being built on trust. That trust came from the cultural homogeneity of the population. Trust can only happen if people feel they belong to the same group. Mass migration negates integration, as it is impossible to integrate a large number of foreigners if they start living all in the same areas, creating segregated societies. Also, decades of lower birth rates and non-stop immigration can and will change a country. It was also understood that the welfare state is a delicate system, a highly skilled labor force paying high taxes in order to fund it. The tax burden in Nordic countries is over 40%, but since wages are high due to a highly skilled workforce and competitive economy, the population doesn't feel overwhelmed by their tax contribution. At the same time, the state collects a lot of money, making it possible to provide high-quality state services. When thousands of unskilled migrants move to such a country, they struggle to compete in the labor market, leaving them at risk and forcing them to seek help. Naturally, this is frowned upon by the natives, as the migrants did not contribute to the system they benefit from. The system then comes under pressure, unable to work effectively as more people claim benefits. There are multiple challenges to integration, lack of skill or low education, and the language barrier. Culturally, it also becomes a problem as Western societies are built on a set of values that are not the norm in many places around the world. If a migrant moves to a community of his culture and is not exposed to the local or national culture, he will not have any incentive to integrate and, sooner or later, cultural differences will lead to social unrest or even crime. Denmark decided to take a stand. Two big reasons helped to understand this. First, the 2005 cartoon controversy and the 2015 Copenhagen terrorist attack. Events like these leave a mark and, as a result, the strict immigration policy was adopted, as we said across the two big parties, something practically unheard of in Western Europe. Denmark's policy is based on deterrence and fiscal prudence. One of the other big reasons why Denmark has a tougher stance on immigration is because it does not have to follow certain EU laws, all thanks to a referendum. In 1992, 50.7% of Danes rejected the Maastricht Treaty, which proposed the creation of the European Union and further European integration. Less than 50,000 votes decided the outcome. But what a difference it has made more than 20 years later. Since this treaty could only be ratified with full consensus, Denmark negotiated certain opt-outs that still impact the present day. For instance, Denmark retained the krona as its currency and holds exceptions when it comes to justice and police, enabling the government to conduct a stricter migration policy. Only after negotiations and ratification of the Edinburgh Agreement in 1992 was the Maastricht Treaty signed. So what has Denmark done? In 2015, the Danish parliament approved a new temporary protection scheme allowing the government to return asylum seekers to their country as soon as conditions improved. The following year, the government approved the Jewelry Law, a controversial law, but one that still had the votes of the main opposition party. Approved with 81 votes to 27, it gave permission to authorities to seize the valuables in jewelry and gold of migrants to help pay for their stay in order to save their state's resources. This law was amended in 2019 to exempt items of sentimental value. But there's more. 
This law also states that any refugee entering the country with more than 10,000 krona or $1,500 has to contribute to the cost of their accommodation. Asylum seekers also have to wait three years before applying for family reunification. This is a textbook example of Denmark's deterrence approach. The goal is to discourage refugees from seeking shelter in the country, leading them to choose other countries instead. The fact that none of this was asked of Ukrainian refugees, though, sparked criticism. Denmark also created return centers for migrants already living in the country that, for one reason or another, were ordered to leave but disobeyed that order. It usually means that he or she must reside at the center, sleep there every night, and follow strict rules. There are fines and even imprisonment for non-compliance. There are three of these centers, but the Danes take things even further. But before we move any further, if you like what you're seeing, please consider liking this video and subscribing to our channel. A few clicks can make all the difference to us and help the channel grow. Thank you. The Danish also want to prevent the rise of parallel societies and ghettos. Neighborhoods, usually in public housing, where migrant communities remain separated from the local culture, sometimes living under their own specific set of rules and laws. Many migrants in communities such as these might not be employed, increasing the possibility for crime and further exclusion. To tackle this problem, the right-wing government passed a law in 2018 intended to reorganize public housing neighborhoods with a high percentage of non-Western immigration until 2030. Once again, the political consensus among both major parties was on full display as the following government of the center-left Social Democratic Party continued their policy. This is a very ambitious plan that is almost unheard of in Europe. This plan assumes the government taking over the houses, which includes the literal destruction of some buildings and other infrastructure and forced relocation of families. The law requires that in neighborhoods where at least 50% of the population is of non-Western origin or ancestry, the percentage of public housing cannot exceed 40%. For the government to take action though, certain criteria must be met, including at least two of the following. Low income, poor educational performance, high unemployment, or a high percentage of people with a criminal record. This means that the Danish government will have to empty, destroy, or even sell thousands of houses. The houses deemed good enough to avoid demolition are sold to investors for renovation and further resale in the housing market. This way, the neighborhoods will cease to be secluded areas, spreading the immigrant population across society and preventing ghettos from surfacing. What scares some is the forceful action by the state. Finally, in order to prevent children who live in these areas from becoming trapped in segregation and future exclusion, they are mandated to spend 25 hours weekly in preschools, learning Danish culture and values, reinforcing the assimilation process. And then there's the asylum policy. We've already covered the jewelry law and the return of asylum seekers to their countries once certain areas are deemed safe, as is the case with Syrian refugees. In 2021, the Danish parliament voted 70 to 24 to fly asylum seekers to a third country while the application is being processed. This has not gone unnoticed as the European Commission and human rights organizations have expressed concerns or even accusations about the human rights of migrants not being respected in third countries like Rwanda, which are supposed to hold migrants, not being safe. The government has responded by saying the goal is to have zero arrivals from non-official channels. The official channel being the UN resettlement system where asylum will be granted based on humanitarian criteria. In 2015, Denmark decided to stop the agreement where they would have to receive 500 refugees via the UN resettlement program per year, also called quota refugees. It wasn't until 2020 that the Danish government decided to open quotas for refugees again. Between 2020 and 2022, Denmark accepted 393. Failure to distinguish economic migrants from those who are actually fleeing war and persecution, combined with the EU's legal framework and pressure from activist campaigners, prevents a swift resolution of many claims. Successive Danish governments have shown to be resolute and undeterred by criticism and pressure from activists, NGOs, or even the European Commission. 
that is also something you don't often see. Only 1,500 people applied for asylum in Denmark in 2020, the lowest number in 20 years. In the same year, Sweden recorded almost 13,000. Denmark's approach might be a sign of things to come and serve as a model for other European nations since Denmark is not in the news for the wrong reasons, like Sweden or Germany. The EU Migration and Asylum Pact is an attempt to keep the EU together, but since mass migration has become a main political weapon, other countries may adopt the same policies as the country of the Little Mermaid. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time.